what my was actually meant to be a summary or synopsis of what we have done throughout the day. The going has been so smooth that it looks like we have been here since yesterday and we could continue to tomorrow. But anyway, just I go through in what I feel is the current trend situation as, uh, as I proceed what is happening around me in the world. Considerable progress has been made in recent years in medical and surgical treatment of personal disease. I feel that there are two main things which is happening. One is transition to macro incision with tracheal surgery, and the other is combination treatments. Let's talk about this MIVS, macro incision with tracheal surgery. Surgical treatment of uterine diseases promises to be permanently transformed by the introduction of new sutures 23 gauge and 25 gauge surgical systems and instrumentation. For today's vitreatin surgeon, the primary goal is to provide minimally invasive vitreatin surgery that can deliver improved comfort and faster visual recovery for our patients. I see a strong rationale these days a trend towards small gauge vitrectomy, which obviates the need of sutures reduces the post-op recovery times, and induces less trauma to the ventricular. We have the option of 25-gauge MIVS, and visual rehabilitation in a group of patients treated with 25-gauge instruments. We have known that it is faster than it was in 20-gauge group, and this was probably due to less induced cardiovascular stigmatism. The subjective post-op pain has been significantly lower in 25 gauge vitrectomy group in the immediate post op period. We have had reduced operating times, minimized surgery induced trauma, reduced post op intraocular inflammation, and reduced patient comfort. The incidence of cataract formation is also less using 25 gauge instrumentation, and post op recovery is accelerated. But well, while every transition involves some period of adaptation, complications such as rear hypotony and choroidal detachment for 25 gauge surgery have decreased significantly with the introduction of oblique angle secularotomies and greater surgeon familiarity with instrumentation and techniques. However, introduction of 25 gauge instruments have not met with universal approval, primarily due to problems with flexibility, flexibility of instruments and poor illumination and 25 gauge proved to be a difficult transition for some of us. However, thanks to the use of oblique incisions and 23 gauge instruments, the issue of instrument stiffness has now been resolved and we can now concentrate on further improving our surgical maneuvers and techniques. 23 gauge MIVS seems to offer an ideal compromise between the enhanced safety of 25 gauge surgery and the familiarity of traditional 20 gauge vitrectomy. It offers many of the advantages of 25 gauge, but without the problems some surgeons experienced in dealing with the overly flexible instruments and decreased flow rates. The extra sharp curved tips of these instruments allow better visualization of the retina during the tissue dissection and the precise grasping effect makes delicate tissue removal that much easier to achieve. The greater control afforded by the stiffer 23 gauge instrumentation translates into safer and more efficient vitrectomy surgery. Epidectal membrane dissection has also been made easier. In dissection of fibrovascular proliferations, as the port's location has been moved to 50% closer to the distal end of the tip, that with the 20 gauge instrumentation, it gives us a better control and enables us to cut much closer to the retina without compromising its safety. There is also much better duty cycle with enhanced fluidics and high efficiency in cutting the fibrovascular membranes. In terms of machine settings, one of the clear benefits of 23 gauge instrumentation is that there is no need to use a higher aspiration rate. And of course, other size instrumentation of 25 gauge can still be used. The cut rates of 2,500 cuts per minute allows for a greatly enhanced performance compared to 20 gauge instrumentation at the same retinal levels 
which translates into safer and more meticulous shaving of the peripheral retina near the vitreous space or even posterior. Furthermore, we have now the introduction of xenal light source to some retractive systems, which has greatly enhanced angular illumination during the macro excision uh, retractive procedures. But of course, the usual precautions for phototoxicity apply. This you see here, the, how we have gone from 20 gauge to 23 gauge to 25 gauge, and the probe stiffness has improved by changing the internal diameter. The probes are now 57 percent stiffer. The stiffness, as you see in 20 gauge, was more 130, but 23 gauge is 35 grams, and 25 gauge is 14 grams. The distance of the tip to the port has really enable a better dissection process for us all surgeons. Comparing 25 to uh, 23, the illumination are better now as we have a xenon illumination. Halogen versus xenon, xenon gives good light any day. Now the critical question to be considered in growing trend towards this surgery is whether small gauge really does translate into better outcomes for the patients in the long term or not. Micro seizure technical surgery does offer patients reduced pain, greater independence, a better subjective perception of the vision in the immediate post hoc period as compared to the traditional 20 gauge to technical surgeries. However, there are some concerns. There were concerns about increased and optimized risk. Irrigation of the ocular surface with 5% provision iodine, both at the beginning and the end, tends to reduce the infection. Also, after the removal of the cameras at the end of the procedure, removal of any remaining traces of the vitreous with the vitreous cutter should be done. In terms of post hoc issues, some hypocrisy was to be expected in the immediate post hoc period. Patients will experience some hypocrisy, usually lasts one to two days, and then it disappears, and the comfort of the patient usually improves dramatically. So, we have seen that our one trend now has been everybody going in surgery to minimally invasive so we have also somehow found this MIVS minimally invasive retractive surgeries and I see greater trend towards especially 23 gauge surgeries being happening in the surgery now. Next the trend that I see is the combination system, the combination treatments both in ARMD and in DME, diabetic metodema. Anti-VEGF treatments are now popular and have proven their benefits, but there are still some patients left with low visual acuity after many injections. Combination therapy is an interesting option and may provide better long-term outcomes than monotherapy alone. There are also other exciting new treatments in pipeline. We have heard about gene therapy, radiation therapy, short interfering RNA, and VEGF trap and many others promise exciting new avenues of research. However, we need more data and controlled studies to be able to make better judgments about how to offer best treatment strategy to our patients. Rationally, for the combination treatment in medical and surgical retina is that combination therapies take account of the multifactorial nature of some of our most sight-threatening retinal and macular diseases. They may offer the most promising treatment strategy for patients, especially with pathologies such as wet AMD and diabetic macular edema and the macular edema following the venous occlusions. Let's focus initially on exudative AMD. Now, AMD is a multifactorial disease, and my belief is that its management should consider as many of the different factors as possible. While anti vgf monotherapy antagonizes a major part of the pathogenic cascade, it is not the whole story, and we should not neglect other important aspects that play a role in EMD, such as inflammation and fibrosis. Recent clinical trials have demonstrated a high level of safety and efficacy for the triple therapy approach, combining PDT Uvesicuzumab and corticosteroid exalitazone. This treatment strategy is safe and efficacious for patients with AMD in terms of their visual equity outcomes, 
and retreatment phase and is a step in the right direction towards one day being able to offer more individualized treatments of each of our patients. I think henceforth, individualized or personalized medicine will be one of the major focus in the future of both the healthcare system and in the industry. The safety and efficacy of triple therapy approach. Many studies have been done on patients with all types of CMB, secondary to and PMD, who underwent triple therapy. In one such study, patients were treated with PDG using a reduced light dose of 70 seconds, and within 16 hours of receiving PDG therapy, patients received intravitreal injections of dexamethasone 800 microgram plus 1.5 milligram of vivacizumab. Visual equity in study patients improved in a total of 41.3% of patients who gained three lines or more during the follow-up period. The decrease in the retinal thickness was also statistically significant, and there were no serious adverse events, such as endophthalmitis or IOP spikes. But monthly injections were used in other previously published studies also, with other anti-VAG drugs also, and intravitreal injections were required every four and six weeks respectively. However, with the combination treatments, more than 80% of the patients just required one treatment. In the drive towards better individualized treatment for MD patients, there are, however, still many unanswered questions relating to many factors, such as the role of systemic and local inflammation, the correlation of cytokine values and lesion types, the timing and dose of PDG, anti-inflammatory, anti-cytokine therapy, and other such factors. However, there is a strong rationale for combination treatments in diabetic macular edema. Now, in respect of the diabetic macular edema, we see that there are many important questions about the relevant pathogenic pathways which are still medically treatable and components of this disease remain, however, some of them unresolved to now. There is nevertheless a strong rationale for adopting a combination approach to diabetic macular edema as well. We know that inflammation is treatable, VEGF upregulation and cytokine expression is treatable, and altered tight junctions may also be somewhat treatable in these patients. Similarly, the blood sugar levels and elevated fatty acids in the blood can also be treated. So when we look at the whole pathogenic cascade for diabetic macular edema, it looks as if the combination procedure should be more effective than more therapy in this disease entity as well. Medical combination therapy is justified in diabetic macular edema patients when inflammation, as indicated by myelopyroxidase levels, VGH levels, and oxidative reactions are all elevated and correlate to the severity of the disease. However, there is currently no means to perform an acute antioxidative treatment. And as the inflammation and cytokine expression are related, what is required from the treatment However, is a permanent edema resolution and not simply a temporary tightness from the treatment. Combination approach on an TB drug that is slow edema. Of course, it's not a slow edema. It's a slow edema. It's a slow therapy, a diffused diabetic macular edema. But it has been shown that free treatment with the resipumab makes vitrectomy in diabetics much safer. While the case is less straightforward for surgical retina, there is nevertheless a clear trend towards combining pharmacological and surgical strategies in macular edema and diabetic retinopathy. The role of vitreous body and determination of absolute VEGF values in the vitreous body on visual outcomes shows us that we see these observations that the posterior vitreous detachment is less frequently found in patients with diffuse diabetic macular edema. And this has led to the assumption that the posterior vitreous detachment with or without the island feeling could be therapeutically efficient. There are some reports on resolution of macular edema in 55% of patients after posterior vitreous detachment compared to 25% or less with attached posterior vitreous, although the data on visual equity outcomes were inconclusive. Vitrectomy in diabetic macular edema with posterior hyaluric traction 
makes sense, but the approaches are not yet standardized. Should we do the membrane peeling plus island peeling plus steroids? At the moment, we cannot answer these questions. 0.5 ml of either Avastin or Centus is injected two or three days free of, which decreases the proliferation of new vessels, shrinks the collagen tissue and the size of retinal vessels, and decreases the macular edema as seen on ophthalmoscope. Decreased leakage following this pretreatment is helpful to the surgical technique using the advantages of 23 port and predicts. In conclusion, the case for pretreatment using duracetumab is more clear cut for such patients because this leads to complete regression of new blood vessels and means that protectomy is that much safer when the time comes for surgery. That is how we have gone through these current trends overlooking the various and parts the retroretinal surgery is taking from MIVS to combination treatments to so much talk about Avastin and Lucentis and the use of steroids that we are on the pathway to some kind of individualized treatments for our patients to give them a better health care or better service, better quality of vision, a better quality of life. Thank you very much.